Good evening. My name is Ryan McCormick, and I am co-founder of Goldman McCormick Public Relations, goldmanmccormick.com. Today, we are going to do a two-part interview. It's going to be Lessons from the Legends featuring two legends in public relations, featuring Mr. Dick Gutman and Mr. Michael Levine. As you know, Mr. Gutman is a world-renowned Hollywood press agent. He's represented over 200 superstars, legends. He is author of an incredible book called Star Flacker, Inside the Golden Age of Hollywood. You can learn more about Mr. Gutman and his book by going to the website starflacker.com. Also with us is Mr. Michael Levine. Michael Levine has represented over 58 Academy Award winners, 34 Grammy Award winners, and 43 New York Times bestsellers. He's also authored 19 books. You can learn more about Mr. Levine by going to his website at michaellevinemedia.com and sign up for his newsletter at lbnealert.com. So, with that being said, we are with these two incredible legends, and let us begin today's interview. First off, you both are in a club that some would call the exclusive of the exclusive. The PR agencies that you both started are internationally respected and praised, they're considered the best in the world. You both had visions that not only captivated the public, but also captivated very powerful people. And there are 7 billion people in the world, and all of them are practicing some form of public relations. So how did you two attain such high levels of success, and what did you do differently? Mr. Gutman, we will start with you. You know, you never take the trail you think you're going to take. Well, I was a um, stu- film student at UCLA, <clears throat> I had never heard of publicity. I needed a job. I went to a company that needed an office, but it was called Rogers & Cowan. I had no idea what they did, but I I got paid, and I also got mileage to deliver things. And one day, I knock on the door, and Kirk Douglas answered. And I thought, what are these guys doing? So I started reading the memos that I was delivering from office to office, and I found out about public relations. I'd been a journalist all my life. And I was a film student, and this was you know, what I was designed to do. Okay. And talk about yourself, Mr. Levine. Well, I'm blessed in that I had Dick uh, to watch before me. You know, mm-hmm. I um, I remember later in life, in the last couple of years, at lunch with Dick, he would tell me, you know, a very interesting way of thinking about our career. It was kind of... Uh, uh, having fun, right? Humor, fun with uh, your work, your media work, and uh, that's a whole different way, you know, almost like a, <clears throat> a certain kind of practical joke of, uh, of, of messaging, and it's a whole different way of thinking about your career, but you know, I I did not have a good upbringing, Ryan. I think you know this. I was born yeah. in New York. I I had a very I had an alcoholic mother, and I I suffered from this thing which wasn't very well known at the time called dyslexia, and so I barely graduated high school, and um, I came out here, and I was always interested in politics. I was always interested in the entertainment industry, and I came out here. And uh, and just kind of, as Dick wisely points out, serendipity plays such a role in life. And uh, I came out here and 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 followed in the in the footsteps of Rogers and Cowan of uh, and Dick Gutman. i my God! I remember when I first started. I think a couple years in, I was at a restaurant once or something, and I. I saw Dick Gutman sitting there with his partner, and I couldn't believe it. And I I don't know, somehow I got the courage. I don't know how. I just got the courage to walk by them and say hello. And and, and I said hi, and they were both so nice to me and encouraging to me. And I thought, my goodness gracious, if men of their stature in this industry could be nice to me, maybe, just maybe, perhaps, I could work in it too. And, And so... I know it sounds kind of funny now, but at the moment, that was a very, very big day in my life. It was a signal in certain ways that perhaps I could also work in the same business. Interesting. And Mr. Gutman, observing Michael 
over the years. What have you learned about him, and what impact has he had on your perception well, about he, public he, relations? He's a great initiator. <clears throat> I mean, he's, he started LBN, which is basically a news yeah, he's in competition with Huffington Post and the Associated Press, and very readable uh, condensation of the news, uh, which I'm always happy to take a look at. But uh, in the, he covered bases. Uh, I, I know in, uh, in 19, at the very end of 93, Barbara Streisand was going to return to performance at, uh, for pay in theaters. Uh, for 27 years, she had not performed for pay in, uh, in before a live audience except she would do certain uh, fundraising events. But this was different. She was coming back into it in very glorious circumstances at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. And there was so much to do, and uh, we asked Michael aboard to to assist us on that. And it was really a, a, a real assistance. You know, the, the, he came up with really good ideas, covered bases. Did we think of this? No. Let's think about it. And uh, I thought it was I was very impressed with what he did. I remember one meeting uh, that we had that was very instructive. Um, Marty Ehrlichman, who was the manager, invited Dick and I. First of all, I was so thrilled to be working. I mean, think about this. My goodness gracious, here's a guy who barely graduated high school, no college education, and I'm working somehow, some way with Dick Gutman and Barbara Streisand and Marty Ehrlichman. So, and I'm from New York. Can you imagine? Can you imagine this? So now we are invited. Dick and I are invited to a rehearsal. And we go to this rehearsal, and at the end of the rehearsal, Marty calls Dick and I into a meeting. And uh, Marty says, gentlemen, what do you think? And somehow, I forget how the conversation goes, but one of us may have said, well, I thought it was good. And Marty said the most interesting thing. He was a kind of brilliant, curmudgeon guy, and he said, you know, fellas, good closes on Tuesday. And, of course, he was talking about Broadway and how good isn't good enough. And I He's talking about that. life, really. That's, that's, uh, that's talking right. about life. That's right. <laughs> Dick, talk about that for a minute. He's talking about life. Good closes on Tuesday. Can you talk about that, Dick? Well, you have to... You have to represent – first place, you're not the talent. The the talent is the talent. Anyone I represented who uh, you know, was a superstar of the world was not something I made that happen. Their talent made it happen. Uh, to tell you the truth, I, I wouldn't know how to get anyone from A to B, but I know how to get people from D to Z. And, uh, <laughs> and because it's, Good line. You, you have to start with the reality that – you know, you, you can't. I never. I can't. I can't, can't even understand that I was in the company of a of a Gene Hackman or a Paul Newman or a Cary Grant. It's, it, it astonishes me. And so, what you begin with is you begin with a bright shining star, and then all you have to do is point it in the right direction. And uh, hey. I think that's pretty much it. But the rules, the rules of publicity, are really the rules of life. Uh, I always thought uh, I, I'm a rule collector. I, I, I'm not a collector, but recognizer. And uh, and I always ask everybody I know has t- taught me something. So Warren Cowan was the for me the operative um, life uh, inspiration of Rogers and Cowan, which was a publicity firm which handled more stars than MGM had. It, it was just, I don't That's think true. there was ever that congregation of stars. Never. Before. And it's still a, a vastly, uh, a vast and, and really excellent company. But I, I would also always ask the question, I said, what, what's the first rule of publicity? I, I'd ask, and there's a lot of different answers. He said the first rule of publicity is get the hell out of the shot. That was really important for me because what it said was not so much that you shouldn't be in the photo, which you shouldn't be anyway, because uh, you don't want people to, to know that you're client has a press agent you want that everything that happens has to be just an expression of their you know prevailing talent and uh that among the first rules of publicity i collected i i finally realized the most important one is um do unto others as you would have others do unto you 
that may be the most important rule, rule of life. And yeah. however talented you are, if you're dismissive of people, and there are you know there are people in our business who had power and used it dictatorially, um, you're making a mistake because um, one of the first one of the first talents you have or the first assets is the ability to let people honestly like you. And they can't do that unless you honestly like them. And Mr. Gutman, in your book, I just want to mention, Ryan, I can testify that in 1983, and he had no way of knowing it, you know, 35 years later, that I, he'd be, Dick Gutman would be on a phone call with a man who he met. I couldn't do anything for Dick Gutman or Jerry Pam at the time we met. Nothing. But they treated me with not only dignity, they did, but encouragement. And that encouragement, which they got nothing for, um, I could do nothing for them, allowed me at least for a moment or maybe and and um, both simultaneously a moment and a lifetime to feel uh, some degree of um, validation that a um, – at that time, man, who was feeling not very uh, confident about myself, it allowed me. So he lives by that rule, evidently, uh, did in 1983, long time ago. So, you know, I, I, I do see the light in people. And, you know, definitely Michael came in shining a bright light. And I think actually I have dyslexia too, and I think that's an advantage. Everything's an advantage if you use it to advantage. And uh, for for me, dyslexia means I may not see things as they are the first time, but it gives me a chance to look at everything twice. And uh, that's a very interesting. I've never heard it put that way. That's very interestingly said. Well, it's 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 an embarrassing thing sometimes. I, I, it is. We were handling a company called Kings Road. Is when I was partnered with Jerry Pam, and I pick up the paper and I see. The headline is, King's Road Takes Public Bath. Oh, my gosh. So I go to the office. I'm trying to stay away from that. Finally, I go into Jerry's office. I said, okay, let's talk about King's Road. How do we solve this? What's the problem? He said, what's the problem? I said, the paper, the headline was, King's Road Takes Public Bath. He said, it says, King's Road Takes Public Path. They're going public. They're doing an <laughs> IPO. Uh, I, I – uh... I never told Dick this story, and I didn't know Dick had dyslexia, but about a year and a half ago, I was at a dinner party, uh, somewhat uh, fancy uh, dinner party, uh, and a uh, <clears throat> large group, a good group of people there, and, and David Geffen was at the dinner party, and I was talking to David, and David has dyslexia, and I have dyslexia, and David said to me, you know, Michael... Forty years ago, we had a different word for dyslexia. And I said, really, David, what was that? And he said, dumb. It's true. It's no, true. Cause... I have that in my own life. We, uh, I didn't know I was dyslexic. I just knew I had I, – I could only read ten pages an hour of a book, which is tough in college. Yes. And um, our daughter – one of our daughters was was struggling. One of our daughters just was, you know, challenging, charging through school and all kinds of honors. The other one was was struggling, <clears throat> and she sort of took her took it in her own hands and went to, "I don't want to be in the grade for the 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 lesser learners. I want to I want to be in the other grade." And and she really accomplished a lot um, uh, academically, and. And became a uh, psychopharmacology was I think her major, and um, she came home and she says, "Well, I found out what I have. It's called dyslexia." And I found out what I had when she told me about that. Yeah. Wow. And she's done. I actually wanted to ask you both a question about dyslexia. Mm -hmm. It's just that you're talking about what impact it had on your lives, and I was wondering if you feel that by not having dyslexia how your lives would have been, and do you feel that you would have not been able to utilize other aspects of your intellect, which would eventually lead to your success? I was wondering if dyslexia actually was a blessing because it forced you to utilize other areas of your you know, mind, passion, spirit, which got you to a certain place. Michael, take that first. I, 
I really believe very strongly now in the advantage of disadvantage. Malcolm Gladwell uh, wrote this very interesting and I even think important book recently called David and Goliath. And he talks and outlines a, a thought process around the advantage of disadvantage. And so I would never wish dyslexia on a child. No parent would wish dyslexia on a child. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. On the other hand, your question was about whether or not that disadvantage that Dick and I had may have been in some strange alchemy, part of a strange alchemy that created the advantage. And I think that that, that uh, paradoxically it's true uh, for me. I think it created a certain kind of compensatory uh, way of thinking and, and behaving and uh, and I think Dick indicated it may, it may have for him as well, a way of looking at things a second time. Never heard it put quite that way. It's very, very well said. So I want to vote on the show today that I indeed believe that paradoxically there is an advantage to disadvantage. Yeah, I think that's, that goes without saying. You know, it goes right back to the necessity is the mother of invention. If you don't, what's more important, success or overcome? Overcomes much more important because it's something you do. Success is sometimes something that falls in your lap. Overcome, overcoming never falls in your lap. And I think that's it. And in publicity, because this audience is going to be primarily people in publicity, right? Yes. Okay. It's a Correct. it's a tough and challenging field because you're always, you know, with with your clients, you're always one step away from the door, or else you're always one step away from their gratitude. And you have to think. In publicity, you have to you can't, you can't just go by the book. It's it's always something that you come up with that's really creative and daring that's going to make things happen. I, I, Sorry, I'd like to ask Ryan if if I'm permitted. Uh, I just I don't know why I want to ask uh, Dick this question, but I just want to ask him: What do you think now, with the many years that have come and gone? What do you think? the historical significance in Hollywood of Jay Bernstein was to the publicity business? Well, Jay was, I didn't think of Jay as a publicist, really. He he was a a showman. Jay Mm -hmm. Jay Bernstein, actually, when he started, he and I were, you know, young guns at Rogers and Cowan. And Jay was, you know, always looking for the advantage that he could take, that he could take the next step forward and and i really enjoyed him uh me too i really enjoyed him he was he was one of the i must have had 30 office partners jay was one of the most interesting ones and jay thought in terms of theatrical terms so when he was dating joni summers you won't remember this ryan but joni summers was um one of the really hot singers of i suppose this was the 60s and um he was uh, madly in love with her, and she she wasn't with him. I think he knew that. And so he comes in the morning, and he opens this little box, and he, sh- he shows me this extraordinary diamond ring. And I said, what, what is that? He says, I'm offering this to Joni tonight. And uh, I said, oh, my God, A, can you afford it? And B, I mean, this is such an extravagant gift that, you're going to overwhelm her. You won't get a, a straight answer. And he says, uh, no, no, I know she's going to say no. I said, then why did you go buy it? He says, this thing, this was about $4. It really looks real. <laughs> he says, I'm going to open it, and I'm going to propose to her, and she's going to say no. And I've I've spaced this out, and there's a, a storm drain about 12 feet from where I'm going to be, and I will say to her, Joni, if you will ne- not wear this ring, no woman ever will, and I'll throw it down with a storm drain. Yeah. And, uh, and he did, and it, and it gave him it was a great theatrical gesture. And I'm sure she kept it in her mind the rest of her life. But um, one time... Uh, there, there I did not know that. Story. I didn't know that story. It's utterly well, I was the plausible. Only, I was the only one that knew it. And, uh, yeah, it's utterly plausible, though, having known Jay. 
No, so what happened was there was a wonderful columnist named Jim Bacon who for, had been the the top uh, reporter for Associated Press. He was uh, just a, a major uh, uh, journalist in all of our lives. And so he had a column in the Los Angeles Herald Examiner then. And he wrote some story about Jay having gone to a ski resort and he got a broken leg. And so he had not one to waste anything. He got all the people at the Opry Ski to uh, sign his cast and then he's auctioning it off for charity. And um, so I called Jim and I, I told him I really liked the story. And I told him the story of uh, of Joni Summers. And I don't, I don't know why. I know in my business, nothing is off the record. Nothing, nothing, nothing is off the record. But I didn't think he was going to run that because it was such a strange story. So the next day, that's his lead story, his headline story. <laughs> and uh, about 10 in the morning, I get a call, and it's Jay. Dick. Oh, good morning, Jay. I don't know what was going to happen. Good morning, Jay. Uh, Dick, did you give that story to Jim Bacon? And I said, well, I, uh, he said, don't lie. You're the only person in the world who knew that you gave that story to Jim Bacon. I said, yes, Jay, I did. He said, well, I don't know how to thank you. This is the most wonderful thing anyone has ever done for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the uh, the story is fantastic, even if you don't know the people. But if you know Jay passed away. But if you know the people as I do, oh my goodness, that's such a great story. I can I can almost feel the the phone call. <laughs> well, Jay was great. Me? When when he went into business for himself, I would I watched because he had a really from the beginning he got a lot of really good clients. So we had occasion to, to, to talk about uh, a year or two later, and I said, Jay, um, you know, I, I look at in those days we all looked at each other's client lists. Uh, enviously or thoughtfully, whatever. And uh, I said, you know, I watch your client list, and it's great. And you always have about 60 clients. But I notice that every 60 months, I mean, every six months, about half of your list has changed. And uh, and I said, well, what, why is that? He says, well, for me, the, the only excitement is going out and getting the client. Because right, I'm yeah. not that excited about doing the job. I said, well, if you, kept the, if you did the job, then you could – Keep that and have grow by fifty percent every six months. He said, "No, that would be boring." Uh, Mr. Gutman, in your book Star Flacker, you say that in PR, it's not so much about what media you know, but what media knows you. And I was wondering if you and Michael can please elaborate on this principle, and if you can both explain the types of media professionals, at minimum, that a publicist should have in their speed dial. Would you like me to answer that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I I think it's very important because I mean sometimes by the the uh, obstinacy of your refusal to die, you become a little bit you know known, which is I can't think of a, of a press agent being famous, nor what I want to be, but you become known. And um, I think a very interesting example of that was a, some years back there was a magazine called Premier. It was a very important magazine. Of the yes, time. it was. In the industry. And so they were doing an article about uh, press agents, and a guy named Ted Casablanca um, called me. He said he wanted to include me, and and I said, who else is in it? And it was Paul Block and um, Leslie Dart and Pat Casey. These are all you know giants of our business. And I don't I don't like publicity. I, I think it goes back to get the hell out of the shot. In this case, for this particular article, he's going to take six people, and either you were on that list or you weren't. So I thought, on is better than not, and mm -hmm. so I do it. So he, the, it turns out to be, but I did it at seven o'clock in the morning. I didn't want my staff to know about it. I had to make him uh, freeze dried coffee because I don't know how to make coffee, and uh, we go through the questions that it was: if you were a car, what car would you want to be? Blah blah blah. Finally, he comes to the question that I know is the, the key. He says, do you lie? And um, I said, yeah, Y-E-A-H, yeah. Well, everybody else didn't. <laughs> they say, no, you could tell a, a little white lie to save somebody's feelings or uh, or you should never do it because it, it invalidates. But there's no person who doesn't lie. I mean, of course, I, I would have been lying if I said I didn't lie. <laughs> 
And I thought, oh, this, I'm going to suffer for this one, but I, at least I couldn't say that. I don't lie. And so I get a call from the from um, the editor of, I believe it was Maxim, who, with whom I had no contact whatsoever. And he said, um, I, uh, I, I, I just realized that you and I have no relationship, and I, I'd like to uh, formulate one. And I said, is this because of the Premier Magazine? And he said, yeah. And he, he said, but I... I said that I, I was dishonest. The answer was honest, but I said that I was dishonest. He says, it's more important that you answered it honestly. Let's get together. That's so, a very interesting story also about life, isn't it? It is. You have to, you, you, first place, if you're going to lie, don't t- tell an obvious lie, because then you've identified <laughs> yourself. <laughs> But uh, and part, part of Star Flacker, I think the, the most joyous part of Star Flacker, which is about publicity, yes, but it's about the golden age of Hollywood. When when you walk the streets, or you felt like you were walking on the yellow brick road. I mean, there, you would see the, the, ta- the town just, just sort of buzzed with the, the sense of being in the center of the entertainment world. And so uh, what I try to do is to catch that aspect. And also the, the stars then were very different than the stars. Now, the stars now are, you know, they're prisoners of the Internet and of the tabloids. In those days, the media actually helped you build stardom. They realized that stardom was a major aspect of the American society. Uh, Gary Cooper dis- defined who we were as people, you know, Sergeant York, Lou Gehrig, the, uh, the sheriff in uh, the high noon. He was America's authenticity, and and you gauge that. And Cary Grant was the the charm to which we all aspired, and, and occasionally some of us can can uh, achieve that. But th- these people's stardom was was really important. At the beginning of World War II, there was a movie, Mrs. Miniver, in which Greer Garson, God bless her, showed the spirit of the British people. And America wasn't that committed at that moment. But once we came to understand through Greer Garson what the Brits were going through, we were 100% into that war. Uh, Dick, I'd love to ask you a question because I – the first major star back in 1983 that I signed, international star, was Charlton Heston. And who was Charlton Heston in that pantheon of, or that era of Hollywood? Well, he was a he was heroic. Uh, mm-hmm. It was interesting because I I, did, I had a couple of occasions with, uh, he, believe it or not, in the mid 50s Charlton Heston was one of the stalwarts of the most liberal group of people in Hollywood it was Robert Ryan That's was, absolutely was, true yeah but he was he was in there and just part of it and it was Mark Ritt, not Marty Ritt and Mark Robeson it was just these wonderful wonderful people and because of one of the staff members at Rodson Cowan a great prestigious named Ted Loft uh, who personally helped uh, check in his uh, emergence um I, I knew him, and that was how I knew him. Later, I got to know him when uh, John Gavin uh, was running for president of the Screen Actors Guild, and I was very much behind him because there was another guy came in who I knew would draw the town into a strike. I, I don't, I'm, I'm pro union. I don't like strikes. So t- the, the wrong people get hurt. And um, so Jack came to me and said, "Would you do the campaign?" I said, "Sure." So Hessen was the outgoing um, president, very much concerned that uh, Gavin come in and that sanity prevail. And so we had this this meeting, and I said, the the other guy he's running against is going to have a press conference the day, the day that the ballots are mailed out, which means hmm. the next day his point of view will be in the paper exactly when everybody gets their ballot. And we hmm. have to counter that. And Heston said, well, how do you do that? He said, well, we'll have a press conference the next day. I said, no, it's too late. Go and vote it. He said, what should we do? I said, well, you, as the president of the of the Screen Actors Guild, should be there as a, an audience, and you should be at the back of the um, of the uh, of the audi- of the auditorium. And at the end, when this guy has to say, they'll all come to you and say, well, what do you have to say about that? So it'll all go out at the same time. 
and uh, which he, very reluctantly he did, but it worked. And so years later, he was the head of the NRA, and Barbara Streisand had produced a film, uh, Long Island Incident, which was about a mass shooting on the um, on the train in New York, and it was very much uh, uh, done. It was about registration of gun and controlling who, to whose hands they fall. And we knew the NRA was really upset, and we also knew it was a Sunday night that Monday morning, eight o'clock. Chuck Heston was going to have a press conference at the Beverly Wilshire. So we gathered uh, together the, the uh, Jim Brady organization, which was trying to have the same gun, gun legal applications. And um, we were prepared. And so Heston had his, his press conference, and he delivered it all. And I had told the media that the head of the, uh, the James Brady Foundation and it was going to be available to them afterwards, and uh, Joseph Sargent, who was the director, would read Barbara Streisand's response. And um, but it, we would have to reassemble them outside this uh, this room where they were all set up. So at the end of the of Heston's presentation, I said, "Mr. Heston, um, might I ask this of you? Uh, I know that you've paid for this auditorium and such, but the media do wish to know about uh, Ms. Streisand's response." And if you would relinquish your podium, that would be a great service to them. What could he do? You know, he, he, when he left that room, he gave me a look. You could have frozen a fish on that look while he was angry. But it worked. I have some, you know, Dick, I, I hadn't thought about that story in a long time, but I have some mild memory of it, Just, just mild memory of it. It's an interesting story, as is your book, by the way. If if people haven't, if people are interested in publicity, they should read Dick's book. If people are interested in Hollywood, they should read Dick's book. But here's my uh, attempt at a contribution. If people are interested in a very unusual time in American life, a time very different than the time in which we find ourselves. I that's think most, people. That's the most important. That's absolutely the distillation of what we were discussing. It's a, it's a story. Anyway, if you're interested in a time that is very different than the time in which we live, but very seminal to the time in which we live, then I think you. And if and if you're interested in that time, and you're not interested in predict. Pub, publicity particularly, maybe not even interested in Hollywood particularly. I still commend the book because it's a story of an era. Is that a I, – I think you, you, you feel that way, exactly. uh, Dick. No, that's the definition. But there were two things I was trying to, to do. with the book. One of the – is to say, sadly, that there once was a time – once was a golden age of not only of Hollywood but of stardom. You know, in those days – they made great movies. I mean, not that we. There's, I worked on uh, Spotlight last year. It was a great movie. There were. There's always you know four or five really great movies each year. The Oscar lists are you know certainly always merited. But in those days, in 1939, there were ten films nominated. Every one of them became a classic. Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, uh, Nanachka, Stagecoach, uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I mean, it was just dazzling, dazzling. And every one of those films you could see twice a year. Behind them were 30 other films that could have, that are also classics. You know, films of, of incredible uh, importance. And they couldn't even make it into the, into the Oscar list. But we don't have that today. Today, they're more interested the terrible thing is that it was a great movie called Star Star Wars that actually was sort of introduced this change because it came out, it was a terrific narrative film, wonderful characterizations, everything about it was wonderful. But it showed them that if you put all these uh, elect, uh, these um, special effects in, it, you're going to give people a roller coaster ride they've never had before. You can make not... $4 million, you can make $400 million or a $1 billion, whatever it is. And you can make that movie eight times again and make the same amount of money. And so they became focused on that. So you see really good actors like Robert Downey and Mark Damon 
getting paid twenty million, fifty million dollars to do those movies, how are they going to say no? Whereas they could be doing, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington or or Stagecoach. They could they could be making the movies that used to be made that really carried the message of that time. You know, it was really yeah. important for America in the late thirties to come out of its depression and the the wacky. Um, uh, Comedies that filled the '30s were what got us through the '30s. You know, well, that's very interestingly have, sad too. We we had to realize we had to remember laughter, and uh, the screwball comedies. God bless them. There were I could I can watch. I married a witch or uh, the Lady Eve. You know, every night if I had to. They, they were just wonderful. And in those days, you had these terrible dictatorial studio bosses everybody hated them but they wanted to make good movies and they made good movies jack warner you know i've had a couple of occasions with him he wasn't i didn't find him cooth the man he made good movies and they made great stardoms you know they created those stardoms if tyrone power he had a clinker in some film daryl zanuck had another film for him to do the next the next day that would take his stardom back into sheer brilliance Dick, another question. This I know this is not my show, but I don't get many opportunities to <laughs> ask Dick as many questions as I'm I'm doing getting today. I represented Robert Evans, the film producer, and uh-huh. and and Al Ruddy, the film producer, and so I had an opportunity, very <laughs> unusual opportunity, to represent two people involved in what some people think is the greatest movie of all time. And what what is certainly my the the movie that I most the most meaningful movie to me, and that's The Godfather one and two. And so my question to you, Dick, is if a studio executive today walked into a boardroom and said, "I have an idea, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have an idea for a movie. It's called The Godfather." Uh, do you think that movie could be made today? Do you think in the current American climate of filmmaking that The Godfather could be made today? Well, I mean, you have to accept the factor of uh, Francis Coppola, who is a genius filmmaker, and and that was one of his two highest expressions. I think his two best films were Godfather Two and Conversation. And Francis... If, if, but if he was not a very well-known filmmaker at the time. He, he was not he was a, actually unknown. He was actually known, and I knew him quite well because Fred Roos, his producer, and I went to UCLA at film school together, and Francis was actually there, but he, he'd already graduated from Brown. But, yeah, if, he, if there's a film, if there's a filmmaker that has the power, look, Spielberg can make whatever he wants. I don't think everybody wanted to make Bridge of Spies, but that was a great movie. And it got made yeah. because Steven Spielberg wanted to make it. They could the get point made, I'm but... trying to get at, Dick, is I fear that if a studio executive walked into a corporate environment today and suggested The Godfather, that um, many uh, that the film might not be made uh, because right. no, there, you're are, absolutely right. there are no action work. figures, yeah, there are no the, McDonald's uh, cross promote. <laughs> No, what, you, what you, you're you? absolutely right. They, they're looking for the special effects, but you know they you did know, make. Uh, a, a, they tried to make that film last year. It was uh, Black Black Mass, I think it was called, the Johnny Depp film, and it was, and it didn't work because it was so morbid. I mean, the character was morbid, but the film itself was too, and it it didn't help reinstill the idea that we could still make great personal movies. But they do, you know. That, um, certainly, Revenant was was a personal vision, and it got made because Leonardo DiCaprio could do whatever he wants. It was rather violent for me, but it was it it wasn't a film that depended on special effects. Well, the, the bear attack was a special effect, but it was really more about people intent on avenging themselves. I, I, you're absolutely right. You couldn't you couldn't walk in and solve that story. And and, and I think uh, 
before we leave this topic, uh, there's something worth considering about it, which is to say that Dick Gutman and, and I, to a lesser degree, have posited that we currently live in a world in which the Godfather could not, likely could not be made today. And what are the consequences of that, and what, is the, what, is, what does that say about the times in which we live, and what does that say about filmmaking and Hollywood and, 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 and modern life and, and all kinds of things? I think there are consequences to some of the things that, that I, and much more importantly, Dick, are positing. Well, I'm curious, you know, uh, you, Mr. You Gutman have, and Mr. Le- you're absolutely Sorry. right about that. It's the reason I wrote the book because it's it's a, 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 a celebration of a time when they weren't afraid to make good films; they were afraid to not make good films. As <laughs> and uh, and as a consequence, our film literature was so rich; it isn't anymore. It's it's uh, visual and it's repetitive, and I don't see a way back, and I, I really, what, I'm involved with a, a group called, uh, uh, I'm assisting the Los Angeles City Council in a, a, a practice called the Made in Hollywood Honors. And what we do each year, and into this have come the Producers Guild and the Screen, Screen Actors Guild, the Musicians Union, Teamsters, all these great, the California State Film Commission, they're all behind it now. And what we do is we, take the list of nominees for the Oscars and now also for the Emmys, and we honor those that were made in Hollywood. Just saying, you know, this is Hollywood. Was, yeah. was all made here before. And we're trying to bring that back. And I think if we if we can do it, uh, it will help, you know, maintain that flow. Well, even, uh, even the effort is an important one on behalf of the city. And so since I live in... Los Angeles, I commend you. Well, we're actually we're encouraging to return in California because, and the California State Legislature now has put up, they're matching New York in the, uh, over $300 million a year assisting these film productions. But if we get it back, in the first place, in those, in those days, Hollywood was a family, was a family business. People, uh, gaffers and uh, cinematographers and stage uh, hands went home to their families and had dinner at home, and now they have to go off to some place in North Carolina, and more likely the sound guy's not going to get the job because they can hire some guy at a Radio Shack to turn the machine on, you know, the, the, denying the fact that every one of those crafts is an art. And if we can get it that we come back and Hollywood is this sacred place where they make entertainment and they open people's eyes. I mean, those movies were all... They had a movie on last night. I've seen it 28 times. I think it's the greatest film of all time. How Green Was My Valley. There was John Ford, very much a, a very conservative right-wing uh, filmmaker, who made probably 25% of all the great humane films that were ever made. You know, and... It, and he and he stood up. He stood up against uh, during the um, during the blacklist. He stood up against uh, Cecil B. DeMille. He he said, you know, Mr. Mr. DeMille, we all admire your films, but we don't admire we don't admire your despisal of other people who did what they thought was at, right at the time. And it was John Ford. You know, there were these people were giants, and and it was an industry that allowed them to be giants, and it's. People have to do it. So it's not as easy anymore. The ground's not as rich. Uh, Mr. Levine and Mr. Uh, Gutman, I wanted to ask you if you feel there is a comparable difference between PR book smarts and PR street smarts. And do you have to have a balance of both to be successful, or can you be successful in just one or the other? And we'll, well start with you, Mr. Gutman. Well, Michael's been very successful both as a press agent and as an author. You should answer that first. Well, uh, I I have had uh, uh, some success on the on the book side of writing about the theory of PR, and and again I'm not formally educated, and so what I, the 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 
I wrote a Michael, book. Michael, that's uh, not true. Your life has been in education. Yes, that is true, but not in a formal <laughs> sense. So yeah. I wrote this book uh, 23 years ago called Guerrilla PR. And the, the concept, that what, what occurred to me, and maybe it occurred to my dyslexic mind, is that PR is analogous in many ways to gift wrapping. And so if I come to visit you today, Ryan, or you – Today, Dick, and I give you a present, I give it to you in a Tiffany box, and your mind, the gift, will have a higher perceived value than if I give it to you in no box or a box of less prestige. And the reason that's true is not because you're a jackass or a psychological fool, but because we, Dick and Ryan and Michael and every person listening to this, live in a culture in which we gift wrap everything. And so we gift wrap our politicians and our corporate heads and our movie and TV stars and even our toilet paper. And so that analogy of public relations to, to gift wrapping was the basis for the book I wrote. But that said, uh, theory, book learning, uh, uh, formal education, all wonderful things to have, pales for my experience to the the uh, street smarts that are acquired by uh, daily life uh, and and in and, and seeing life itself as the great teacher mark twain said i never let school interfere with my education kind of an interesting way of looking at life as a great teacher or the greatest teacher and he had very little schooling yes I mean, you know, it's interesting. The, the I've noticed that among women, the most powerful women I know had no education. Barbara Streisand left high school at 17. I mean, she's as smart as she is talented. Um, Kathy Ireland didn't have uh, uh, anything beyond a high school education, and she runs a two and a half billion dollar a year corporation, the, the biggest private. Brand in the whole world. Let's see who else there was. Other people. Uh, Liz Taylor, I mean, Elizabeth taught me so much. I mean, it was mostly about kindness. But Elizabeth didn't have an education. I'm sure she got it from the various people like Richard Burton. She was involved in. Uh, my wife grew up in Nazi Germany. She had no education. She was a, a, a itinerant farm worker because they didn't want to get killed in the cities. And then after that. Uh, the schools were all denazified, which meant that uh, no, nobody who was a teacher was teaching them. She's the, the smartest person I know. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gutman, Mr. Levine, uh, for the sake of time, uh, we're going to only do one more question, and I'm going to take you both to a place, and that is the year 2060, where everything goes by very fast. <laughs> Life goes by much faster than we can ever expect. So, Mr. Gutman, Mr. Levine, if you were both responsible – for giving a two-minute eulogy at each other's funeral, how would you present it? Mr. Gutman, we will begin with you. I, th I think one of the most important things about Michael is that he was what we don't have very much anymore, a self-made man. <laughs> he, he educated himself uh, in spite of the, you know, the consequences of dyslexia. He said, I've always found, found him one of the most innovative of press agents, and I, I truly think, I truly think that innovation is really the soul of, of really good publicity. Unfortunately, it, today it's becoming uh, much more electronic by the books that you go for the, you want something to trend and everything. I leave that to my staff; they're really good at that. I love the old days when you and a, a really intelligent journalist sat down and figure out what would make a good story. That was so much fun, but Michael's invented. He, he, he invented. He he approached publicity as a, a learnable um, craft, and uh, there was only one person who had done that before was uh, Henry Rogers, and I thought his, his book was a little stodgy. But Michael's aren't. Michael's books aren't stodgy. They they have that kind of excitement of being. You have to be willing to fail. You know, sometimes you look, wind up looking like a horse's ass when you, if your thing doesn't come off. But um, but I, but it, he, he became distinctive, and I think that's 
Everybody has to do that in any business. But I think um, I would talk about uh, is Dick Dick's significance uh, about a world in which relationships mattered. Today, what I see, uh, and I don't want to sound like an old cranky man, but I'm very concerned about a point of view that I see in modern life, uh, wherein young people seem very transactionally obsessed. And uh, and Dick and was, I think, a leader in a different point of view of life, which was relationally centered. Uh, today, in transactional thought, a person only calls somebody if they need something, and the thing that they need can be obtained quickly uh, with an email. Uh, and and so we have lost a, a center to relational thought. Uh, Dick and I have had lunch a couple times over the years for no reason. I didn't need anything from him, and he didn't from me. But I learned a, a good deal uh, about PR and about life and about character and about a time in which relationships were more centered. Now, I think this current thought process of transactional thought is a bad path and one that I think all our modern uh, friends frenetically uh, texting each other are going to live to regret. Uh, I think this is going to this thinking is going to end up in the ash heap of history. Um, and so, at at Dick's significance is that of uh, one that was relationship centered. Um, and and Dick, if you wouldn't mind terribly, could you talk, give me your comments about that? When you see the modern world function today and everyone's only interested in what's in it for them immediately as opposed to how things were more relationally centered in the past, could you talk about that and your concerns around it? I think, I think it's a reason I, I wrote the book because mm -hmm. uh, I saw it slipping away. That was the art... The art of publicity still exists. I mean, you can come up with creative ideas which will drive the the um, online traffic that apparently is the most cherished thing for publicity now. I think the 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 fabric of, of fame has been very very devalued. I mean, you see people now who are famous for for being famous and uh and, and that that's primarily driven by notoriety. I, I think a lot of the of the new stars are driving that because they insist on leave, living their lives they they insist on insisting their lives upon other people. There's no reason in the world that some kid in Chicago should be reading about some rock star or what what he said nasty about someone else. They should be involved in their own experience of life. It makes if you go to to a restaurant. There's a table with four people. Each one's on the phone with somebody that's not there. What about they're in a relationship? That's it's, that's the essence, really, of what you were talking about, Michael. And it really. And by the way, Dick, I, you don't know this, uh, and I don't know this about you, but I, you don't know this about me, because of my dyslexia and also my just point of view of life, but principally dyslexia. I don't text. And so this, of, you don't text. Okay, great. So Dick Gutman doesn't text and I don't text. Well, I don't text because of dyslexia overwhelmingly. And I'll tell you, first of all, uh, pe c contemporary people, uh, young people today, think that is bizarre. They don't know how I exist. They don't know how I function. <laughs> but I'll tell you from my point of view, I think my life has been bloody advantaged by it. I think that had I fallen into this trap of hiding behind uh, technology, as so many do, my life would have been impoverished. Uh, uh, now, so there is an advantage to disadvantage. I didn't text because I was dyslexic, but I think it's turned out to be a good thing in my life uh, overall. 
I, I like face to face. Yeah. Face to face interaction, and I, and it's been a basis of, at least what I try to teach press agents. You can learn all you need to know about the technology, but if you don't, if you don't try to learn about the people you're sharing your life with, you're going to really cut yourself off at the pass. Mr. Dick Gutman, Mr. Michael Levine, I want to just bring to your attention that sadly we are out of time. And uh, what a surreal honor it was to talk to two legends of public relations, uh, people who are just incredibly accomplished. We had a lot of questions we wanted to ask, and I hope that we can do this again sometime. To learn more about Mr. Dick Gutman, please go to his website at starflacker.com. To learn more about Mr. Michael Levine, please go to his website at michaellevinemedia.com, and please sign up for his LBN Alert at lbnalert.com. Mr. Dick Gutman, Mr. Michael Levine, thank you both so much. Great honor to have you both today. It's really great to do this because – Publicity is a really important craft and art, and uh, we have to try to keep it that.